assembling as we are according to the teachings of the New Testament on this first day of the week to worship God in spirit and in truth. I was made mindful that this is the first Lord's Day of a new year and our first time to worship together in this year. Now actually there's no real significance to that because one day is as another day. And I've never been one to make New Year's revolutions. I don't even make New Year's revolutions. (laughs) I try not to. But I do try day by day throughout a year when I see things that need to be controlled and changed to do that. So if I make any kind of resolution for this new year, it is wherever there's a need to change throughout the year, if God gives me this year, that I'll be able to do that. Thus, as we read in the scripture reading this morning, we are to be holy, even as he is holy. So if there's anything I would preach today as a lesson to begin the new year, I can't think of any better one than be ye holy as he's holy. And when I think of holiness being dedicated to the service of God, as that word is applied to us as members of the church, saints, set apart, suitable for the master's service, and how we need to be reminded that we are here to serve God, that the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole reason we're here. And it's the only way we can get ready to meet our Lord in the judgment so that we'll be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What's involved in being holy as God is holy? Well, that brings up the specifics of this sermon, and that is the mind of Christ, the mind of Christ. Concerning the likeness of a father and son, all of, our, all of us have heard statements like this, like father, like son. Or he is a chip off the whole block. And on and on you could go. Well, what do we mean when we use such terminology? Well, we're declaring that the son is a copy a reproduction or a replica of his father in some way. Thus, maybe they like the same things. They have the same values. Maybe it's just an appearance or in certain actions they have the same appearance. Well, as we speak of each of us, and how we are, according to the scriptures, to have the mind of Christ. That's another way of saying, be holy as he's holy. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Well, I think this passage informs us of the need to imitate Jesus Christ. Someone said it this way, talking about a son in the flesh being like his father, a chip off the old block. Somebody says of children of God and the family of God, we need to be a chip off the old cornerstone, that cornerstone being Christ. We need to replicate Christ in our thinking, in our actions, in our conduct. Why is that the case? Because Jesus is the flawless, the perfect example. In 1 Peter 2, verses 20 and 21, 21 and 22 rather, for even here and do you for even here and two were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. An example is a pattern that you should follow his steps who did no sin 
neither was guile found in his mouth. There's no hate about him at all. Now here's a letter from an apostle to Christians saying this is what we need to be. We're to imitate Christ. We're to walk in his steps. And that means we strive daily not to sin. We cannot have a light manner of thought, a flippant attitude toward transgressing God's law, for such is sin, 1 John 3, 4. Or omitting what God obligates us to do, sins of omission, John 4, or rather James 4 and verse 18. Now with those points in mind, Here's the main beginning passage that should flow through this whole having the mind of Christ sermon. Paul plainly said, let this mind be in you. Let means I permit it. I make sure that it is. I work toward that end. I'll have nothing else but this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and of things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, one thing is for sure when it comes to having the mind of Christ. If you're not a Christian, you have to become a Christian before you can do what we're going to study today. You must believe in Christ with all of your heart, a confidence, a trust, a faith, a belief that's built upon the evidence in the Scriptures, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Upon that foundation, what obeys the commandment of Acts 17 and verse 30? To repent. To turn from a life lived to suit yourself with a resolve to live according to the teaching of the Scriptures. That's the mind of Christ living in you. Having done that, one confesses one's faith before men that Christ is the Son of God, Romans 10 and 10. Then one completes his obedience to Christ to become a Christian by submitting to the authority of Christ and being baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. That's the beginning point. If you haven't done that yet, you cannot let the mind of Christ live in you. You cannot be what God says, I want my children to be, for you're not one of his children. You're not a citizen of the kingdom of God. You're not a babe in Christ. You can't grow up in the family of God if you haven't been born in the family of God, John 3, verses 3 and 5. And thus, there's the beginning point. To have the humility that we've read about in Philippians 2 concerning Christ. Whatever was needful to save man, Christ did it. There was no argument. He condescended. He left the form of God in heaven. He took upon himself the form of man, a servant. And he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin, Hebrews 5. Teaches us in verse 9 that we're to be obedient unto Christ. So when we talk about the, the mind of Christ, when we talk about being holy this year, you're not going to be holy if you don't have the mind of Christ, if you don't have the will of Christ working in you. That means you have to know where that will is, and it's in His Word. 
And you have to resolve that throughout your days you'll spend much time with his word, meditating on it day and night, rightly dividing it as you study it, 2 Timothy 2.15, with a complete determination to do whatever it is that God asks you to do. Here's the point. You know this. He will not ask you to do, he will not command you to do anything that's not for your own spiritual good. So Paul tells us in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, that we are to have the mind of Christ. He tells us in this context also what it takes to have the mind of Christ. And that's what we want to spend the rest of our time on. What does it take for me to have the mind of Christ? I have to have a mind of sacrifice. I guess we would appreciate the word sacrifice more if we actually were bringing something that was very important to us that we couldn't get along without, so to speak, and we gave it to God. Yet Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Our very bodies are offered in living sacrifice. Under the old law, they offer dead bodies of animals, but we offer our living body. And day by day, we live a sacrificial life, giving up the things important to us according to the flesh and giving it over to God. Verses 6 and 7 make it clear in this passage of Christ who, being in the form of God, thought it not a robbery to be equal with God, a thing to be held on to. And the only way he came to earth was the they pulled him away from it. He didn't want to come. That wasn't Christ. But notice, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant, which means a slave. And he was made in the likeness of men. The word became flesh, John says, and dwelt among us. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what we're expected to do. We are members of the spiritual body of Christ. We were baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. At that baptism, our old sins were remitted. God holds them against us no more. We are babes in Christ to grow up in greater knowledge and practice of the truth as we're studying now. So our Lord set the prime example of sacrifice when he gave up the form of God and the glories of heaven. And our poor minds, being finite and limited to the here and now, can hardly grasp of what it would be to give up those things. But Christ gave them up for us. The reason we're able to be where we are at this time is because Christ gave those things up. Came to earth and suffered and tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. That he could be a sacrifice for sin. Jesus then counted not the being on an equality with God a thing to be grasped, held on to, or robbery to be equal with God because he was God. He's in the, he was in the form of God. Jesus is identical to God because he's God. And yet he put himself into his own creation that man had corrupted to live a righteous, perfect life, to save those who had corrupted it, even when they weren't interested. Christ died for the ungodly. So he gave up all of the comforts. It's a poor way to describe heaven, but it's the best we can do. All the comforts of heaven to be a servant on this earth where we are for our own good. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Keep this in mind. He did not have to do that. He did it because he loved us and he cared for us. Even when in reality we didn't care much for ourselves because we did as we pleased. We didn't think about eternity. We didn't think about the judgment. We didn't think about hell. We need to think about accountability to God. We live for ourselves. But Jesus sacrificed his own life for us. And he left the perfection 
of heaven for the ordeal of this earth, ultimately the pain and agony of the cross. Think about, and I won't go into detail on it, but think of the trial Christ put himself through. He didn't have to. Always at his beck and call were legions of angels to deliver him. And they were ready. Think about that for a minute. They're there waiting. When the command would come to come rescue him, they would come. But they never heard that command. He underwent a terrible scourging. We've heard people describe scourging. We've read about it. Many people even died under Roman scourging. It was so terrible. But he underwent that. And that may tell us something more. After being up all night, going through kangaroo courts, no justice whatsoever. His own people who had 1,500 years to prepare themselves to recognize, see, and receive the Messiah. They cried, crucify him, crucify him. He was mocked. He was taunted. He was treated shamefully, ending his life after six grueling hours on the cross of Calvary. And he ended it by his own will because he as God in the flesh knew how long to suffer to satisfy his Father in heaven. John 10, verses 17 through 18, Therefore doth my Father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay down, I lay it down by myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. The commandment I have I received, this commandment I have received of my Father. That's why in this life he would say, My will is to do my Father's will. My food or my meat is to do his will. Not my will, but thine be done. That's all he did was the Father's will. And it pertained directly to the saving of our soul. Think about it for a minute. Why should he even come to earth except to save you and to save me? We couldn't save ourselves. And we didn't care. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Like I said last week, that God is love and love takes the first step. It doesn't wait to be called. It steps out and does what's right. And right here was to save us from sins. Because we don't appreciate how valuable our souls are. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, look around about you. Men give all sorts of things without any contemplation of a soul, many times denying they have a soul, that when they're dead, they're just going to be going out of, they go out of existence. So to have the mind of Christ, which we as members of his spiritual body must, we must have the mind of sacrifice. We must have the mind of sacrifice because it's a part of being holy, what it is to be holy. And as we read in our reading this morning, be ye holy, even as I am holy. That's an impossibility if the attitude of sacrifice is not within each one of us. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, to which I have already referred, Paul has that in mind. I beseech you. Beseech means on bended knee, I am begging you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, we should think more about God's mercy for us, what all it entails, that we deserve eternal condemnation, but he's a merciful God. So by his mercies, Paul is begging them that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Notice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Well, how is that possible? Well, that's what we're talking about this morning. By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How do I renew my, renew my mind? I quit thinking to do things as I please, as important to me as a human being in the flesh, as most people live. <clears throat> I choose to follow the will of Christ. I choose to go His way and not the way I would choose if I had not the Word of God to direct me. And that involves sacrifice, giving of important things. They're important to us as humans on this earth. I must sacrifice worldly pleasures. A whole host of folks live totally for worldly pleasures. Look around about you. 
That's what they do. Then there are those who make their family, their physical family, the most important thing on earth. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about what a family ought to be. And we ought to strive to have it. But no family should come before doing the Lord's will. No family should. Then what about our friends? A great many people have friends. They don't turn loose of them. They like them. But they know if they do what the Lord says, they won't be able to do the things they used to do. There are even those who enjoy social status. All of that appears, appeals to the vain glory of life. That which is empty and worthless will not abide the test of time many times, but certainly will not abide into eternity. But people take these worldly pleasures, their own family and their own friends and their social status, and those things come before God. And even some members of the church will do that kind of thing. Over the years, and I've seen it written in many bulletins because people have done it so much. Well, you look out and where are the members? Well, they're there most of the time, but today they're not. You find out later, well, I had kinfolks coming this afternoon. I had to stay home, get dinner ready. Do you think that's having the mind of Christ? I don't. don't know how anybody could, just thinking honestly. But leaving that, we also know to have the mind of Christ is to have, and notice how all these link together, the mind of humility. Again, back to Philippians 2, 8, and the first part of that verse. It says of Christ, as Paul wrote, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He, by his own will, humbled himself. What did that mean? Well, we've already studied it. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There's been no more terrible, agonizing, shameful death devised by man than the death on the cross. You might say, what about burning at stake? Well, that would certainly be horrible. I can't conceive of that. People have burned at the stake. But I'm told, notice I'm told, <laughs> through medical people, that once the fire burns for a while, it kills the nerve endings, and that helps destroy the pain involved, but I don't want to get to that stage. <laughs> but with the cross, it lingers on, on, and on. Many times they stayed on that cross for days before they died. Thus Christ ended his life. And you'll notice because of the Jewish Passover about to start, Pilate, willing to honor the Jews, not disturb them any further, sent men out to break the legs of the folks on the cross. That would hasten their death, or they'd be dead before it all started. But he came to Jesus, and Jesus was already dead, and fulfilled the prophecies that not a bone of him would be broken. And thus he ran a spear in his side, forthwith came blood and water, which itself evidences the fact he'd been dead for a while, because the plasma is separating from the red blood cells. Amazing how God covered every facet of everything for every reason. So Jesus being God took on the form of man. He could be tempted as a man. He couldn't be tempted in the form of God. He could suffer as a man. He couldn't as God. And he could die as a man, but he couldn't as God. Someone said, taking on the form of a man would be like us taking on the form of a worm and ending up on a hook in a catfish's mouth. Now, that's a fine thing. I don't think any of us look forward to that. But it was even worse than that. I think of great significance in this passage is the word humbled. It comes from a word meaning to make low. How low did Christ go? To bring to the ground. Our, our English word humiliation is probably our closest to what that meant. Jesus was humiliated. He was dishonored. He was disgraced. And taking on the form of a man. 
And he suffered that humiliation on a daily basis as he lived in the very creation that he had done and as man he corrupted it. James wrote in James chapter 4 and verse 10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Maybe that helps us understand what he's telling us to do. Be willing to be humiliated for the cause of Christ. Does that help us understand better why Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Luke 14, 11, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up. Does it see how far down we need to go in our mind about ourselves and in our life before Christ will lift us up? In Acts 5, 41, concerning the apostles and their persecution for preaching the truth, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. But remember this one, Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans 8 and verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So when you're undergoing this terrible humiliation because you walk in the footsteps of Jesus, because you want to be holy as we're commanded to be, as he is holy, when people reject the truth that's designed to save their souls and they don't appreciate you for trying to teach them, and they rebel against it, may even treat you in a bad way. Maybe you'll never be to them again because of your obedience to the gospel and efforts to teach them what you once were. Just remember the Lord and the humiliation that he suffered. And he took it upon himself because it was the will of the Father and it was necessary to save each one of us from our sins and to make heaven a reality for us. Another point is to have the mind of Christ is to have then, it's only obvious I think, the mind of obedience. It's no wonder to me that the devil works hard to try to say obedience is unnecessary to be saved by Christ. Even when you have a plain scripture, such as Paul or the writer, whoever it was, of the writer of Hebrews, making it clear that we're to obey Christ, Hebrews 5.9 that he's the author of eternal salvation to all those who do. Again, back to Philippians 2. And now we'll look at the latter part of verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our lives may not mean that we actually suffer physical death for the cause of Christ. Could mean that. May not even mean that we suffer physically. But it may very well mean that we suffer the loss of friends and family. It may very well mean that we suffer a lot of things, even as jobs that we might take ordinarily, but because of those jobs, they don't help us in serving God. They don't help us seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But our life here is spent in obeying Christ, choosing the ways that help us to comply with his will. Jesus had the mind of obedience. I dare anybody say, I shouldn't, when I'm taught to walk in his steps. In John 4, 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Well, think of the work we as children of God have to do in the family of God. Shouldn't that be ours? Our work was not his work. But our work is to walk in his steps and to be holy even as he is holy and to yield our bodies living sacrifices unto him, which means we must have the mind of Christ, which mind is only in the word of Christ, which is why we should be meditating on it day and night as we study it. Obedience is that for which he strongly hungered and thirsted. Think about that. We're taught to hunger and thirst after righteousness. In fact, they're the only people that's going to be filled according to Christ. 
It was his very reason for being. Remove that from Christ, and what do you have? Nothing. John 6, 68, Jesus said, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Is a person truly converted when he rises from the water to the grave of baptism? If his attitude before he's baptized is not that I'm about to enter into a case where I don't do what I please, but I do what God pleases the rest of my life, that person had repented. Jesus was always concerned about doing his Father's will. Should we not be? Jesus was not concerned about what he personally desired or wanted. He was concerned about what the Father wanted him to do. As we walk in his step, as we're holy as he is holy, as we yield our lives living sacrifices unto him, which is our reasonable service, is that not our situation too? That we're to be concerned about what the Father wants and not what we want. In John 17, 4, I have glorified thee, Christ prays to the Father on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. When Jesus did all that God required of him to save us from our sins, he glorified the Father. Notice he did it through obedience. He didn't leave the Father's work undone. Now that's one of the steps we're to walk in, that we might be holy as he is holy. In John 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it's finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Notice that because of the power God had granted him, Jesus wouldn't even let death keep him from obeying the Father. Well, what will it take to keep us from being obedient? It doesn't take very much for some people. When members of the church just don't really want to assemble with the saints, what do you think they do with the rest of their life? They're pleasing themselves. They're going along with the crowd. But we must have the mind of obedience, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered. And then it tells us that he's the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. So Jesus became complete in obedience. What example is that for you and for me, for all Christians? In order to be saved from our sins and saved eventually in heaven, we must have that attitude. We must be obedient. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 and 9, we read it in class this morning. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. What will be their eternal state? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. There's no way to put it but this. Punishment awaits the disobedient. Could there be a greater reason than this to have a mind of obedience surely none of us in our right minds want to suffer at the hands of a righteous God 1 John three twenty two, and whatsoever we ask we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight I don't know how a person can read this and say obedience is not important how do you do those things pleasing in his sight and not obey him? These are the rewards of obedience. Rewards in this life, but what we all labor for, eternal life, which will be given us at the last day. So what shall we say to this upcoming year and for the rest of this day? Be ye holy even as he is holy. Set your mind on Christ and walk in his steps. Notice what the end result was of Jesus having a mind of sacrifice. A mind of humility. A mind of obedience. Verses 9 through 11 of Philippians 2. 
Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and of things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. All of that because he condescended. He humbled himself. He became a man, did the Father's will relative to our salvation. Death did not overcome him, but he overcame death. And thus he sits at the right hand of God, ruling over his kingdom today. And for everyone who will humbly believe, as we started out with, the plan of salvation and comply with it, he adds to others who've done likewise, Acts 2, 47. And for those of us who are members and when we sin, we know he'll forgive us because we have an advocate with the Father. And when we repent of our sins and confess them and pray for, for his forgiveness, he readily forgives us. Let's keep in mind as we close the lesson, Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, deity, wants to forgive every human being. But he made us free moral agents, and he'll forgive us on his terms, the terms of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we'll receive with meekness in grafted word, it will save our soul in obedience to it. The Father exalted Jesus Christ. In the end, the final of all things, everyone will know that Jesus is the Christ and everyone will give him glory. Those of us who've lived our lives in his church faithful to him, giving him glory by obedience to the truth, we'll just, in a glorified state, continue to give him glory. But those who've rebelled against him, refused to receive his word, rejected his counsel, would not obey him, they will then. But no salvation is possible for them. It'll be too late. If we will have the mind of Christ, as Christ was exalted because he did what was necessary to save us in the flesh. We too will be exalted. As John says, we do not know what we shall be like. But we shall be like him when we see him. So to have the mind of Christ is to have the mind of sacrifice. Is to have the mind of humility. Is to have the mind of obedience. I can only ask in closing this lesson. As the year begins, and you've heard the first one for this year, where we'll hear another one or even preach another one, I have no idea. But will you set your course through the whole year of I'm going to live, as the Bible says, to be holy even as he is holy. If you need to obey the gospel, what a way to begin a new year, but to be a new creature in Christ or to reclaim where you once had by repenting of sins, confessing them, and praying for forgiveness. What a time to do that. But now, while we stand and sing.